Welcome to The Rewind, an R News monthly podcast where we discuss various different topics in the Bohemian Society. I'm your host. Jasmine Lundy. I'm your co-host, Chine. I don't like eggs enough. I get the vibe. Right. <laughs> Let's put that on a shirt. Um, By our last name. Yeah. This is The Rewind. Welcome to The Rewind. Woo! So this is the kind of show where we'll be talking about important topics within our community in a fun and engage engaging and youthful way so <laughs> welcome this is episode six and we're still going to be talking about the orange economy if you haven't checked out episode five you should definitely go and check that episode first and then come back here because it's all connected just like art <laughs> so i am your host jasmine lundy and with me i also have my host Janae Janae winter. winter and then if you've noticed that someone someone is missing that's because one of our guests Jody Minnis she had to tend to other duties but we thank her so much for being on the show and right now we have John Cox who is let me get this right the executive director mm. of arts and culture that's a big title at Bahamar. okay at Bahamar yes so let's talk about the orange economy Okay, well, before we get into that, I kind of like want to do a little hot seat, nothing, nothing too much, just a little pressure though. Um, so my first question I have for you, John, is, well, in your opinion, is the digital age changing the way we view and appreciate art? Ooh. Absolutely, yes. Just, you want to go into that just a little <laughs> bit, just briefly, you why get do you think so? Yes or no? <laughs> um, yes, because it calls into question like the, 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 the um, idea of authenticity and ownership uh, and just the boundaries around which uh, those uh, divisions are policed, uh, you know, and, and, and also it, it, it kind of critiques in a way like what's, what the value system is of the experiencer. Mm -hmm. you know? Okay. Yeah. And my second question is, should the government fund art or should it be just solely left up to private funding? No, I think that the government should definitely create policy that enables uh, the more the development of a more level playing field okay. for personal practice, for commercial galleries, for museum platforms, mm -hmm. uh, and the list goes on and on. I think government should not be uh, the entire, it shouldn't be subsidized right. by government 100%, right. but certainly there should be some incentives given for people to, to be able to go into these fields mm -hmm. and to support platforms um, that will make it, that will make the chances of their sustainability greater. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, That's actually something that we'll be touching on a little bit later right. because the Davis administration actually has some goals specifically for the orange economy and it's a True. laundry list of things mm -hmm. and we're going to get into that a little sure. bit later. But we also want to touch on education. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, we're educating so, ourselves yeah, first. And the audience. <laughs> right. And we want to touch on intellectual property right. because it's it's a bit broad. There's a lot of things to cover mm -hmm. under intellectual property. So we want you to please, you know, let us know and our audience know what is intellectual property and break it down for us. And how does it, you know, relate to the orange economy specifically? Mm -hmm. Right. So intellectual property as a topic is, as you just lead, what that is a pretty heavy the heavy topic, right? Okay. So to, I think the most simple, high-level way to describe it is it is the property of ideas, creations, inventions, uh, symbols, uh, artwork, songs. It is mm. everything that uh, embodies the completeness of those things that I mentioned, as well as the processes and the methods and the formulas that go into to achieving those things. Mm -hmm. And um, so somebody's intellectual property would be the property of their creativity, right? Which is particular to you, to me, to somebody on the street. Um, so and I know for most people they go, well, why is that even important? Why do we need to think about right. you know, my creative process versus your creative process? Because it is, cre it, it is connected mm -hmm. to a whole um, system of how things get built out. In some cases, people say, well, what's the difference? You know, I had an idea, it didn't really amount to anything. It's not valuable. 
Oh. And some other people have an idea that could be the simplest idea in the world mm -hmm. that somehow somebody hears and says, oh, I like that idea. I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's certain things along the kind of linear process. Like I like to think about things in metaphors, right? So if you think about like the whole creative process is like a, is like a string that has one end to another end. Um, and one might just be the kind of flickering of the idea that comes to you in the night that is for you to make a to write a song or to come up with a beat or to make a painting or to design how to stitch a pillowcase together all the way to the actualization of that thing there's that kind of process and how that string relates to the environment that it's in um there are points at which the content of that string becomes um quite vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, to uh, it being taken away or even how what you're pulling into the string. You know? So it's a little bit of a, it, it's, a it's definitely a, a, it's a knife that's all blade, right? Mm -hmm. So it's sharp on both sides. So you have to be very, very careful with how you are uh, negotiating your intellectual property because it, it, it uh, can help you and defend you and, and support you and, and right. be, you know, it's, it's your right. But it's also sometimes people don't recognize what they're doing in their creative process. Like they're taking things, borrowing things that they don't necessarily know that they have the right to borrow. How can an artist, you know, you talk about the process and everything. How can an artist possibly trademark their work? Right. Is that the right term? Because That is copyright. the right term, okay. yeah. So basically with copy, with, uh, with IP, it, it, there's a couple of uh, categories, right? Okay. So you have trademark, you have patent, mm -hmm. um, you have copyright, right. mm -hmm. and then you also have trade secrets. Right. Um, Ooh, so all of those one. things. So this is right, all of this is quite legal, right? right? And so I think for a lot of creatives, you know, for us, we people think that, you know, creatives are the opposite of wanting to be technical and administrative. They just want to be in this emotional state of mm -hmm. creativity. Um, but I think when you, when you have to become an arts administrator, somebody who runs a gallery, somebody who's an agent for an artist, somebody mm -hmm. who runs a museum, uh, doing retail, producer, all kinds of different things in all different fields, you have to start thinking about it. So your question was, how does somebody trademark mm -hmm. something? It's a legal process. Okay. So you have to engage a lawyer, right. um, and you have to, uh, and that lawyer is going to sit with you and uh, come up with the best terms to describe what it is you're actually uh, trademarking. Okay. Right. So normally a trademark will be about it's something that's concrete. It's a symbol. I trademarked right. the Coca-Cola logo. Right. I trademarked the Nike tick. I trademarked, you know, I say, I'm saying I. Um, mm -hmm. the echo logo right. right the logo for the current it means mm -hmm. it's nobody else could use my logo and say oh there's another current just happens to be the same color way and same everything else and font that everyone else is using um, so you have to describe in the best way you can to your lawyer okay. um, what it is that you're trademarking and uh, express the concerns or the, or the reasons that you're doing it and then he or she as a lawyer then has to document all of that and that process has to go as far as to like the attorney general's office because wow. it needs to be registered, yeah. right? So it, it is not, uh, I think oftentimes people think about intellectual property and rights as um, things to do with um, like you and I, right? It really goes beyond that, mm. right? Because these things, need, these things are binding beyond right. you and I. Right. Other people can kind of come into the fray and um, really confuse things, you know? And so, your first question, mm. I don't mean to come off of that, but one of the questions was about like the digital world right. and how the digital world influences things how everything is so accessible digitally mm -hmm. that's a major major thing right right so you have the access that people have to your work digitally that didn't that wasn't there before right i mean i heard something staggering recently that in the last year there was more content created than in the history of the content being created in the history of the world. Wow. And it's because of the digital platforms. Right. Like, how many pictures do you take? How many? That's true. You take 50 pictures to get one picture that you want, and the content exists. You do all of these things. You, do, you, do, you, you read it three times to get it once. All, mm. Everything is out there. There's, and because 
now that digital platforms enables it, it makes it uh, easy and accessible for almost anybody mm -hmm. to do things. You know, like in the photography world in particular, I hear this all the time. Um, photographers who, you know, worked decades ago will say it's so difficult now because the phones have such good cameras right. that it makes everybody a photographer. Right. Mm. And so that their industry is actually hurt by that mm. because really? people don't like value. Like I'm an actual photographer. I understand the darkroom. I understand mm. composition. I understand all of these other things because everything's in the phone and you could just take a beautiful photograph with your iPhone, whatever it is that you have. Mm -hmm. And then that's the and narrative people are pushing nowadays. Like even on social media, like you don't need like a cinematic camera, you know, right. just take it with your phone and then edit it. Right. Thing. And as it relates to IP, it's your, these, these are your ideas, right? You know, if I have an idea that I think it's a good idea for somebody to run and do a backflip into a wall of fire and land mm -hmm. in a pool of water and, mm -hmm. you know, at this point, point in time in this particular place in this particular blouse and whatever these are all your kind of creative ideas and somebody goes oh that sounds great I'm going to do that same thing and they go ahead and do it wow. and start capitalizing on it <laughs> and then crazy. you go like whoa what uh -huh. was that uh -huh. and so you know the person who did it in the first place you no, go well like did you actually did you did you did you copyright that right. that set of ideas? That's Listen, we see that very same thing mm -hmm. unfolding every day on a very popular app. <laughs> Can I say it? Can I say it? I guess. TikTok. <laughs> Everyone basic what TikTok is is like you basically copy yeah. whatever is in style. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, for example, like choreographers, mm -hmm. they kind of got upset because they would create this type of viral dance choreography and then it's and it's ending up in video games where mm. they are making money right. but the artists themselves aren't making money right so how does this translate um or what do you see maybe the struggle with bohemian artists now um is there any issues in terms of trademarking or you know replicating work like what's what's the issue there is it education i think edu it's a lot of things right okay. i mean geez i wish i could make this more simple but it, it really is it really is not i think in principle it's simple to understand what what intellectual property is because mm -hmm. you could understand what it is and don't do anything but you understand True. that your your work your combination of your creative ideas mm -hmm. are yours right maybe because you probably were influenced by something else and you, you might have brought something into your own work and said, oh, I'm going to do this. So I saw this table. I think I'm going to make one just like it. Um, and then, Ooh. you know, you may you may go out and, and do it before the person who actually, before your um, inspiration does. So understanding what it is is just that your creative ideas, processes, methods, objects are yours, mm -hmm. right? Um, Getting your work trademarked is not necessarily a difficult thing. Okay. Um, um, in the sense, I'm not saying that you could snap your fingers and do it, but it, you can do it, mm -hmm. right? Um, but you have to balance whether or not you think it's worth it to do it. Like, mm -hmm. why are you doing it? Like, okay. So if you're going to trademark, okay. you're going to start a new restaurant and you come up with a new logo and then you have a new recipe to, to to cook fish a certain way and you want that thing to be your thing, you should trademark that because people can come along and take advantage of that. Um, but like I said before, it's you have to be very conscious of what it is that you are absorbing into your process okay. and what you're trademarking so you can protect yourself moving forward. Some people think, well, you know, um, by having something copywritten, and somebody is aware that it's copywritten. Like, let me give you an example. So, like, we're we're sitting amongst a bunch of paintings. Let's okay. just use painting as an example. Let's narrow it down. Um, paintings are a good example because they're tangible. Right. For the most part, they're tangible. Right. So you buy an object. That's the painting. You gave me a hundred dollars. I give them the painting. So on and so forth. Most things are transactional, and most business people, as it relates to creative processes. Are just interested oh i made a painting you gave me a hundred dollars thank you for the paint thank you for the money here's the painting beyond that then somebody goes oh i really think this painting would look cool if this was on a t-shirt mm, okay. okay oh i think we're gonna print these t-shirts wow i'm gonna print these t-shirts and i'm just gonna give them to my 
family because it's a family reunion. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to give them away. I'm not going to make any money. Mm-hmm. Even that is problematic. Wow. Because you don't have the rights to do right. that. And those transactions, if I were, if you were to sell your painting to me uh-huh. and we did not discuss it, the copyright is yours. I could not legally go and take your painting and then make postcards of it and sell them in a store in New York City. I'd be breaching the copyright because I didn't get permission from you to do okay. it. So right. in giving somebody the copyright, you it doesn't mean that you're signing everything over to them. It could mean that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or I'm going to give you 100% rights to okay. do whatever you want to do, right? Um, you could make bed sheets and lamps and you know, light switch, mm-hmm. you know, all kinds of things, right? Um, and a lot of artists don't want their artwork represented that way. Right. right. right? They want some control. Right. So there are ways, as what we call limited license agreements. So you can give somebody the right to do X amount of things, mm-hmm. right? But not, you can do ABC, but not XYZ. Okay. okay. You can limit it to say, okay, well, you can do ABC, for five years, and then after five years, you have to stop. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could say, um, you know, you can do, like if, I could give you like specific examples where there's no resale. Like, so when we were uh, curating this property, right, we have 2,400 rooms on this property, and about 80% of the rooms, we curated all of the work on the inside of the rooms is Bahamian art, but most of it is reproduction. So when we went to the artists, we got limited license agreements with them. And we said, okay, I want the right to reproduce your work mm-hmm. X amount of times in these rooms. And the, the terms basically expressed that, yeah, you can do that. That's okay. But also it's not okay for you to take, you can only do it this amount of times, a finite amount of times in a room this way. But the agreement also says that I would like it if you would not take the same work and do it in another uh, kind of format, ho- format mm-hmm. in the same in another hotel somewhere else, so your hotel looks like my hotel. Mm. Right. So it's like on both sides of the agreement, right? Okay. So it's like you have to come, and this is where it gets convoluted. It becomes it becomes usually pretty meaty contracts, legal okay. contracts that kind of specify right. all of the details. And then the next thing is, I just want to compensate for that. Right. If I look at this painting and I say, okay, I'll sell you the painting, but if you just want the object. And I have all the rights. You get to buy it for hundred dollars. But if you're so and so company, and I think that you're likely to do something with the painting, and you're probably going to make a million dollars on it, right. then you need to pay me more because you're getting the rights with the object itself. Exactly. And sometimes people get the rights and not the object. They say, "I don't want the actual painting. I just want mm. the rights to reproduce it." So wow. then the object lives by itself right. in another kind of sphere. Okay. Oh, it's a beautiful thing, but you can only experience it if you're actually underneath it. No picture, no nothing mm. can be taken of it legally. So, um, I know that's super complicated, but it is, it, it's something that's important because mm-hmm. what ends up happening is you can then robustly frame your company, frame, um, frame, your, frame, frame your, your concepts that develop your brand or whatever in a way that they're protected. So if somebody were to breach it, you could actually go after them legally. Okay. Mm-hmm. You can say, well, hey, how come I noticed that my design is now on your, in your restaurant? Like, when did you get permission to do that? Right. And clearly this is my design. Right. Mm-hmm. You need to protect yourself with those types of things. And so... You know, it it it's it's quite complicated, but mm-hmm. it is something that we have to understand because we're talking about the orange economy, mm-hmm. and you know it does relate to that because it makes uh, people's creative processes more robust, right? Okay. So they're more protected uh, in that sense. But it is very complicated. I mean, I've dealt with it on so many different levels where um, you have to be careful that you have the right to actually sell somebody rights. Because you may say, oh, hey, you know, look at my painting. It's my painting. Mm-hmm. And it may have the same exact composition and color of another painting. And you say, oh, I'm going to give you the rights to do this thing. And someone goes, well, this looks a lot like this other painting. Mm-hmm. Like, do you actually, did you get rights transferred mm-hmm. from that painting to you? For wow. you to then want to establish the rights to give to me? Because it gets complicated. Because right. people can, can come after you. And I think, 
you know, we are in a community that is quite small Mm -hmm. um, and also where this way of thinking um, is still quite new. So, I mean, I experienced it. That's why when we were coming in, we were talking about this, I, you know, wanted to be where my like executive director hat Mm -hmm. from because this is where I experience it, but it affects everything. There's a lot of other things that got, kind of go on with my creative process that I've mm-hmm. seen. I've seen other things happen. I've seen um, inadvertent things happen where the artist is not even realizing that they're breaching something and they do something. So do you think, because um, I know I like I reached out to, I can't remember what the art class was, but I reached out to somebody because interested in, once again in art class. And he told me something along the lines of, like, many behemoths don't want to teach because they don't want other persons, like, taking their techniques. Mm -hmm. Um, So do you think, I don't know if it applies, but do you think maybe the process and, you know, all all that goes into it maybe is hindering behemoths, well, behemoth artists in any way? Yes, I do think so. I think think you can be prohibitively, your creative process can be prohibited because Mm -hmm. you're too... Uh, cautious of you're too All protective, the work and, right? So I think okay. in some cases I know, you know, I, like I, I'll just use myself as an example because I think that's probably the safest thing to do. Um, like oftentimes people say, "Oh, your work is everywhere. How come you allow this to do?" Because I also recognize that there's a value in the exposure of the work. Mm. Like sometimes you have to recognize that monetary return is only so much. Okay. No, um, but the exposure of the work, if somebody says, oh, I really would love to be able to use the work, but I don't have enough money to pay for rights for all of these things, but I would like it to be in this thing. Sometimes you can negotiate other things like acknowledgement. You could just mm-hmm. say, well, I would like the work. I'd like whatever you publication you create or whatever it is you're doing for the work to be acknowledged mm-hmm. as mine or, um, you know, or, or sometimes you don't have those things, but you really feel like, well, if you feel that there's a project that is going to catapult your creative ideas into a into a sphere that right. you might not be able to do on your own, you have to think about it. Like I, I tend to, I had this kind of little saying that people used to say a lot when I was in art school. They said, you know, chess is not checkers, right? And yeah, sometimes you need to be thinking about like, okay, in some instances, maybe it is. Sometimes in order to get your work out there, to get it elevated, right. you need to give it away right. to, for it to become valuable okay. later. So okay. sometimes you go like, well, I'm going to calculatedly like say, okay, well, yes, you can use these things. Um, but be mindful with how you negotiate mm-hmm. the terms because it's not all monetary. Right? Okay. I think everybody thinks, oh, you're going to get sued or someone's going to come after you. And a lot of times people don't sue people that don't have money. Right, it's not worth it. It's actually quite yeah. expensive to yeah. hire a lawyer to go through all that process to sue somebody who really isn't going to be able to like pay you back, right? I mean, oftentimes what it is is people want you, they put provisions in place to stop the further use of the work. It's not really so much about money. They say, well, can you please stop using mm-hmm. a cease and desist? Like, okay. this is my painting. Why is this on your commercial? Right. And, and you didn't get permission to do it. You didn't pay for it. Please stop it. Please take please take the commercial down. Mm -hmm. Um, And in some instances, I think it's like a case by case. You really just need to be thinking about it. But um, um, it is is complicated, and especially with music. I mean, you guys are, generationally, I'm kind of dating myself, but I remember it's a big old thing, like how music gets, how people access music. I mean, in my days, people would go to the store like idiots and spend money on some record and say, oh, look, at this is a record. I just spent $15 for this thing. And now, digitally, you can get music anywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you get it, you could figure a way that you could just share it with all of your friends, and you probably right. didn't even get it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's it's a funny value system um, that that we're kind of working within. I think music is a really unique one because music is non tangible, but it's also it, it's 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 sensory in the sense that it's like purely. It's, it's purely listening, mm-hmm. right? And so the digital platform can capture that audio in a way mm-hmm. that now the audio devices are so smart, this, it's almost like impossible to block it. You know what I mean? And so I think a lot of musicians just said, well, geez, we can't even fight this. I, I remember there's a band, I don't know if you guys heard, it's a, a band from the UK called Radiohead. I've um, heard of them before. So Radiohead, I think, had a, an album that came out several years ago. 
and it was in the midst of this like people downloading and not paying for music and whatever whatever and they just made the album free they said this is free you don't have to pay for it but if you want to pay for it this is how you pay for it mm. and people paid for it because some people said you know what this is your art and i actually should pay for it right it seems like overall, what we really need is education about this vast industry, mm -hmm. right? Agreed. And I know, for example, the government, they have some initiatives um, targeted at the education well realm or whatever. So, for example, one of their initiatives was to establish a tertiary school of visual performing and recording arts in public-private partnership. And... I think it's a good idea, but at the end of the day, my my concern is, are you teaching students how to protect their work? Because, for example, Janae and I was talking about mm -hmm. this when we were planning this episode, and we found so many terms and stuff that we weren't really familiar with, even as media journalism majors. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're like, why didn't we know this? We right. should have We should have learned this in school. Especially if you're teaching creative things in school, like right. dance, you're teaching art, art you're right. teaching music. Why don't we know how to protect oh, these yeah, things yeah. from when we are taught At about these things? At least have a class things. to expose them. Yeah. Right. Education is pivotal right. Right, in all of this because I think the creative processes are often thought about purely in the kind of studio kind of con yeah. concept, right? So it's like you're thinking about the making. Right. Or somebody needs to teach me how to be a better painter, how to sing a better song, how to play the bass, or right. how to know dance a particular way um but the professional practice is something that has always been missing and mm. usually people in the creative fields learn it the hard way right so business administration uh that people do other industries people the industries are more established right mm -hmm. i have lots of friends who are lawyers people mm -hmm. who are uh, accountants and doctors and so on and so forth their industries are a lot more framed up in right. a way that there's huge amount of policy there's industry standards so you get a sense of it like well how much how much typically does a lawyer charge you have a sense of it like oh yeah well you know because there's the bar association and you know that mm -hmm. in the creative field there from a professional context there there hasn't been those bodies don't exist so there's not like an association of professional painters mm -hmm. that would say hey this is kind of like a normal pay bracket that you should anticipate oh i graduated from school i have my master's degree i started i've been painting for five years you know i have this gallery representing me my work on average is probably going to be around this amount of money right this is what it's kind of worth um based on based on uh, a certain set of conditions and experiences that one might have had um but i think the initiative that the government has to set up this institution um is a good one but i think that the the level of or the scope of courses that are um, offered really need to go into a space that has been, for the most part, like um, uncharted territory. Because mm -hmm. I used to be a faculty member at the College of the Bahamas for mm -hmm. quite a while, for more wow. than a decade, um, in the in the from like the '90s into the early 2000s, um, and then I worked at the National Art Gallery for several years before I came here, mm -hmm. and I have, I have my practice, and I had another. Um, Kind of art compound for about two decades in Chippingham, where we had a lot of different practitioners working together. So just based on the raw experience and the memory of, oftentimes it's like conflicts. It's like, oh, this thing came off the rails. If we had done this, it would have been better. If we had a contract, it would have been better. And a lot right. of times, artists are so don't want to deal with that stuff. Mm. It becomes like, oh, who wants to deal with this? Right. Who wants a contract? Who wants to hire a lawyer to give me some seventeen-page thing about like what you can and can't do with my work? it becomes problematic, but this is where, or not problematic, but just sometimes inaccessible. People can't afford to do all of those things, but oh, sure. I think we are at a point where the industry is uh, grown. The industry, this creative economy that we're talking about, the orange economy, where it beyond behooves us to be able to have these things in place. And really what is interesting about this is People who are in the legal field, who are in the finance field, who are in the marketing field, in the communications field, I think now recognize that this creative sphere is actually a sphere that their practice can live in. So like True. if I'm a lawyer and I really just want to practice IP um, uh, law mm -hmm. within the creative industry, it's a, it's a way that you 
can almost like reinvent your practice mm. in this creative sphere. Like, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like it's, it's, now it kind of like bridge the gap. It bridges the gap. Right. So you're actually doing the work that helps prop up this part of the, the industry, mm. which is huge. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, I always use the example of like Art Basel, Miami Beach. I don't know if you guys have heard of Art Basel. Mm -hmm. It's an art fair that takes place in Miami Beach. Um, art fairs are like big trade shows with galleries that they have them, they have them all over the place and North America, Europe, Asia, so on right. and so forth. So you go to like a trade show where a gallery is representing X amount of artists. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is to trade is to sell the artwork to different people. Okay. You're talking about IP and how important it is when you're in that platform. Mm -hmm. It is epic, right? Wow. To be able to have, to understand what you're doing, even to engage the people who are administrating the art fairs is super, super important to be able to understand like, okay, they're asking me to promote my work or to promote my gallery this way. Is what they're asking me okay? Should I be following up True. with them to say, oh no, that's not okay, you can't do this. Because if you don't, if you just come across as naive, they will they take, take advantage. 150% yeah. advantage of it. I can imagine. You know? And so yeah, it's, you know, there's a balancing act. And I mentioned Art Basel because of the orange economy. That right. is a mm -hmm. right. massive, massive injection mm. into the GDP. It is massive, the amount of art that it's sold, the insurance, the taxes, the food wow. and beverage, the hotels, the transportation that's connected, that all the, the pebble that drops in the water is the art. Mm -hmm. And the ripples are extraordinary mm. that come because of the creative industry. Wow. So it becomes that moment where oftentimes I, I like to think about it like this. People think of as, as the art like seasoning the meat, right? I like to think about it as the art is the meat mm -hmm. and the other things right. season the art. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that's, you know, it's like people say, you know, you buy a painting to match your couch. I think you should buy a couch to match your painting. <laughs> yeah. So Ooh. I think we learned a lot today. Yeah. Very, very informative. Very good stuff. Okay, guys. So in this segment, we wanted John and Jody to kind of like, you know, give us, their, give us their opinion of our work. So me and Jasmine, we brought a few pieces of what we painted or draw before or drew before, I should say. And, you know, we just wanted them to give us their feedback. Um, that's what we're going to do right now. So let's get straight to that. Me and Jasmine brought up like just a little something, something not too much, not too much. Um, and we kind of like wanted to present it to you guys, for you guys to see. Bye. So actually, I went to a like launch event, and Jody was there as well. And I wanted I to say hi, out. but I was like kind of scared because I'm like maybe she don't know who I am, um, and it would be weird. But I did this. It's the cam zooming in. You guys see? <laughs> okay. So <laughs> this is what I did, and surprisingly, like I'll, I'll give it to you guys, but. You could actually pass this over, Jasmine. I'll talk about it. Surprisingly, like, as I was doing it, people were like, ooh, and an ah, and I'm like, Because mm. I kind of messed up a bit, but anyways. <laughs> that was, and then up? the vibe of the Patty in the Bag launch for John, who was in there. It was like this, like, turquoise, peachy. So mm -hmm. I was kind of playing off of that, but the colors are a little bit darker. Okay. But, yeah. That's my first thing I have to show. So, like, what do you guys... Tell, tell us more. What are, you, what are you looking at? Um, well, this was during the time I was looking at a lot of inspo on TikTok. And, like, the first thing everybody does is, like, the um, gradient type right. of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I don't really know how to freestyle or anything because I'm extremely new to anything relatively artistic. <laughs> so I'm like, let me, just, let me just try that. And then I just wanted to make it a little more interesting, so I did the little strokes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I appreciate your repetition. <laughs> your repetition. Yeah, you that was my colors, inspo. Colors also very lovely. You could be as real as you want, you know. Yeah, going through the checklist. Okay, so okay. A, <laughs> so whenever I look at um, because uh, I was the adjudicator for the E Clement Bethel E Clement Bethel National Arts Festival. Mm. So I look at things to the principles and elements of art and design, mm. and that's the best way to engage, um, from a. Jud judging perspective, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I think you have a nice balance here, nice repetition, nice use of color. John, you wanna help me? I out? do. I agree with. Why am I so nervous? No, you shouldn't be <laughs> nervous. 
we should not be nervous at all. Uh -huh. But I think what Jody is saying is there's like a formal way to look at things, like your mm. composition and the mm -hmm. color and your line quality and texture and value and all these other things, yeah. um, which I think help understand, help define the thing kind of like from like a competency okay. perspective. Yes. Like, does mm -hmm. it seem like it was competently made? Yes. You know, and I think based on what it looks like and the context that you made it in, it looks like it was. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. So I actually think I was looking at, and this makes me, rem this reminds me of, I'm doing another project that's work related. And I wish my colleague was here. There's a photographer called Spencer Tunick. Have you ever okay. heard of him? Anyway, so he's this guy, I don't know where he's from. Um, and he takes photographs of hundreds and hundreds of nude people like in cities and stuff and on beaches and mm -hmm. whatever from far away mm -hmm. so the the bodies become like one or they just don't you don't engage them close right okay. so you don't know okay. who the people are like okay. they just become shapes and mm -hmm. there was a photograph that he took recently of a bunch of people standing on a beach and they had these like sheer pink fabric things mm -hmm. over the top of their head mm -hmm. and they just kind of pyramided down onto the ground and there was like had to have been hundreds of them on the beach uh, and so you could yeah, barely yeah, yeah. see through that there was like a nude figure underneath the yeah. sheer yeah. fabric There's and so when shapes. I first saw it it made me feel like oh this is like a deep space and these are figures of mm -hmm. some sort mm -hmm. or something like that going on um yeah that's yeah. what I think I get it yeah it yeah. makes me think of something else yeah, yeah. So oh, this is cool. Just Thank cool. you so much. Yeah, absolutely. So I also have a painting here. Yes, <laughs> it was done at a paint and sip. That's Nothing fun. fancy. Alcohol was we, involved. We love so that. please take that into consideration. <laughs> so it's very simple. Oh, nice. I don't know if the camera could cool. pick it up. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So the yeah, trees, do you want to see I it closer? Can, I tried to draw trees at one point. Like, you want to see it closer? It did not come up. The it. trees were very deliberate <laughs> because I, I am someone who loves nature. Mm -hmm. And I personally, whenever I get my own home, I want to have a garden where I actually like force plants to grow in a it's certain way. way. Yeah, yeah. And so that was kind of like my mm -hmm. vision for that. Okay. Okay. I love paint and sips. Because they remind me that I'm not a good painter. <laughs> no, it's like really hard to follow those things. Right. <laughs> so I feel like, you know, and I absolutely cannot paint trees. So this is, this is a job well done. It's very symmetrical. Yes. Was yeah. that like you did that or that's what they were, were after? Well, I painted the tree myself with okay. my own vision. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I really love like the brushwork. Yeah. And your grass. And then the leaves, it's pretty cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. Did you Let's have see. a good time doing it? I did. That's I have it. a wonderful time. I have a great going on as well. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. The top. Yeah. I like the symmetry. Like, it's just odd to me that that wasn't a thing, and it's like everything that's on the right side is on the left side. Yeah. Oh, I don't think that was intentional. But it, looks neat. it looks intentional. <laughs> it looks very, <laughs> it, looks it almost looks like a, like a, what do you yeah. call those things? Rorschach yeah, yeah, tests, yeah, yeah. like when they okay. make an yeah. ink blot. Mm -hmm. And they show it back to you and you go like, what do you see? Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to tell you about like what your preoccupations are. Mm -hmm. yeah. So awesome. art school trick, if somebody asks us if what you did was intentional, you just say, yeah. Okay. <laughs> everything was so <laughs> intentional. <laughs> I meant doing everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Nice. Thank you nice. so much. Okay. okay. Um, I guess I'll show. So Thank like, you for being brave. Thank I was you. trying to get into, this is just like, you know, like when you go on YouTube and you just, Trace, type of, not trace, but like you just follow, follow. what people, yeah, that's, that's kind of like what these, what I was doing these with my niece, because she's yeah, into nice. drawing as well. Oh, wait, let me show the camera. Is it, is it zooming in type of thing? Okay. So I'm going like to pass this on. That. That's really nice. Um, it's more so like, you know, you just follow what they do and try to make your work. The one on the far left, I really was trying to practice with like the shadowing and that was kind of difficult. I don't know why, but my niece was doing such a good job. She's 11. She's really into art. So mm -hmm. having doing this with her was also really fun. Yeah. She's always like, you want to draw something? I'm like, okay. Yeah, I find a lot of um, a lot of kids that I talk to, mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, I like art. And you open a sketch pad, it looks just like this. <laughs> or like anime galore. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there <laughs> is what is it anime. about anime? I don't know. I love it too. So 
It's just something about it, man. I had an anime phase as well. I'm still in I that. I did not. I did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just too old. Yeah, you know, sorry. and anime existed Maybe when I was like, young. Go back to it. When I was young. Oh, My, I have a daughter who also the right one. Yeah. sketchbook looks. Just say that. Similar. Yeah. Similar but different. Mm-hmm. This is really nice. I love the it gown. Is. That's really mm-hmm. nice. The shading and the belt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I also just like the idea that. The figure, man, I'm just reading into it. Like, uh-huh. I like the fact that the figure is not engaging you. Yeah. Mm. You know? I think that was the best one on that. Like, we, the, pu- the puff girl one, like, we really is that struggled. This one? Yeah, like, trying to get the puff right. And, like, <laughs> I, I was think a you puffs are the, never the right. The lips. Because, yeah. like, this was my first time even trying to, like, draw a face. Mm-hmm. This is my first time doing anything. And okay. I just was looking at the picture and I'm like, okay, let me see. Face wise, let me see how to do the brows and everything. And she was still such a good job. She finished way before me. <laughs> but it was really fun, and that's what I liked about it. And you guys touched about it in, you know, episode five. You know, definitely go and check that out, guys. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I love how it was just like free. I found myself trying to like restrict myself at first. I'm like, you know what, just do it. Like, just see, like, no competition. And I'm so, like, yeah. one, one, thing, one thing that I tell artists um, in studio visits is that all, People look different to all of us. Mm-hmm. So how I draw a person is not going to be how John That's draws true. a person mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So I think sometimes when we sketch, we try to get the person Perfect. to look like a person so uh. that someone else could think that it's a person. But I think we should just like lean into how we see people and just mm. render it like that. So that's advice to any kids out there. Just draw the people how you see the people. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And everybody should have these things full of drawing. Yes, definitely. Like good, bad, or different, it doesn't really matter. You always like I look back, back at this, and you just like, oh, this is what I should have because this is a relic of your, of your thoughts. It's just, it's a, just a journal, yeah. you know, in a way. So it's very cool to see this. Very cool. And keep at it. Yes. Okay, thank you so much, John and Jody. I was a little nervous because you know the experts. We don't know what they're gonna say, <laughs> but they wasn't too harsh. They were pretty good with us, and definitely gonna take that critique forward. So this has been episode six. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you so much, John. We've learned so much about intellectual properties, copyright, trademark. I hope the audience, I hope you guys are paying attention, especially if you are a part of the orange economy. This is some good stuff and you don't want to miss out. So definitely tune in to our other episodes. The playlist link will be in the description. This has been The Rewind with me, your host, Jazz. With me, your host, Janae Winter, and Jasmine Lundy. And we hope to see you next time. Thank you again, Sean, and goodbye. (laughs) Now me fumbling the bag. (laughs)